Good morning. Welcome to the third year of our Disproportionality webinar series. We're being joined today by Dr. Leonard Moore with the University of Texas. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Dr. Moore in just a moment, but before I do that, let me go ahead and give you some kind of logistical information. Your audio is muted. Please use the question and answer feature to ask questions, answer questions, or just speak your truth. No later than Saturday, February the 16th, you will receive an email with instructions on how to receive credit for this webinar. If you are not actually online and you are only on the phone, you will not receive an email, nor will I be able to give you credit for attending the webinar because the system doesn't recognize that you have attended. Once again, this will be an interactive webinar. Dr. Moore is anxious for mm -hmm. all of your questions today. And we are lucky, very lucky, to have Dr. Moore speaking with us today. As you read when you saw the invite, his bio is extensive, very impressive. And so the fact that he has taken time out of his schedule today to join us we are very blessed this Black History Month. A little bit about Dr. Moore before he begins his presentation. Leonard, Dr. Leonard Moore is the Vice President for Diversity and Community Engagement and the George Littlefield Professor of American History at the University of Texas at Austin. He is a native of Cleveland, Ohio, earning his BA from Jackson State University in 1993 and his PhD from The Ohio State University in 1998. He was a history professor at Louisiana State University from 1998 to 2007, where he also directed the African American and African American Studies Program and the Predoctoral Scholars Institute. He has been at the University of Texas at Austin since 2007 and was made permanent vice president on June 13, 2018 after serving as interim for a year. My understanding is that students are loving his class and clamoring to get into his classes. And so today, we get a lesson for free. Um, and we always love that. With his background, we thought he was the perfect person to have this conversation around Black History Month and Black migration and how black migration has taken us into um, essentially this particular era. So Dr. Leonard Moore, how the great migration shaped black lives and transformed America. I will turn it over to you to begin the discussion. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I hope everybody's doing okay. Um, uh, this is my first time doing a webinar, so this, this will be a new experience for me. Yeah, so I want to talk about the, the Great Migration a bit, and just to be clear, what I'm talking about is uh, the migration of black folks from the South, primarily the rural South, uh, to the industrial Northeast and Midwest, and then later on to the West Coast. And so you had one Great Migration that occurred around the time of World War I, sort of from 1919 to 1930, and then another Great Migration that occurred uh, during the period around World War II let's say roughly from about 1945 to about 1965. And both of these migrations, as I say in the title, sort of shaped, I mean, uh, shaped black lives and transformed America. Um, when we talk about the Great Migration, we got to remember that after the, so at the end of the Civil War, over 80 to 90 percent of all black folks lived in the rural South, um, you know, formerly enslaved Africans, small percentage of uh, free blacks. Um, but after the Civil War and after the Reconstruction period, you know, Jim Crow was ushered in around the mid-1870s. And one historian called the period between 1870 and 1915 sort of the nadir or the lowest point of African-American life. After the Civil War, African-Americans make some gains. We get three vital amendments, the 13th Amendment, with the, which, which abolished slavery, uh, the 14th Amendment, which granted black folks citizenship, and then the 15th Amendment, which at the time gave African-American males the right to vote. 
Uh, of course, women didn't vote until, until later on. So you had this period of optimism after the Civil War. Um, black folks are running for office. There you have some as senators, some as Congress, some as serving in Congress, largely because the <clears throat> Union Army was still in control even in the South after the Civil War. However, the South comes up with something they call Jim Crow, which is legalized segregation or legalized separation. Um, 1877 election, the presidency of Rutherford B. Hayes, there's a, there's a compromise. Uh, and what basically Northern politicians decide to do, if the South gives them the, the presidential election, then the North basically said, we will leave we will let white Southerners handle their own business. So from roughly 1877 to roughly 1954, the um, uh, federal government and Northerners in particular basically allow white Southerners to handle their own racial problems. So we talk about Jim Crow, you're talking about legalized segregation, and that was necessary because black folks needed to constantly be reminded that they were inferior or indeed not a part of uh, American democracy. So. You segregate the bathrooms, you segregate the schools, you segregate the buses, you segregate every facet of American life, even cemeteries, so again, black people know that they are inherently inferior and not equal uh, to whites. Now, what's interesting about this is that you don't need segregation or Jim Crow during the institution of slavery. There was no need for black people to uh, need to be constantly reminded that they were inferior because they were owned, so that's why Jim Crow uh, pops up because white Southerners have to have a way to maintain initially psychological control over all these black folks in the South. Also during Jim Crow, and other components of Jim Crow, of course, black folks weren't allowed to vote. Um, convict leasing, we understand that in the South, they didn't really build prisons. If you were an African American and were convicted of a crime, you were leased out to a plantation, uh, sometimes at a very low cost. And let me talk about this for a minute. Convict leasing, as it was called, was a, was a model that worked. If I'm the governor of Mississippi, I don't want to spend a whole lot of money building a prison to house African Americans. Instead, what I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll rig the judicial system, and I will convict them for the, uh, uh, I will convict them for petty crimes. And instead of them going to prison, I will lease them out to a landowner to get them back on the plantation. If you've seen the documentary 13, they talk about that briefly. So that is the beginning of the prison industrial complex. But you also had other components, such as sharecropping, where black people were perpetually in debt. And sharecropping was a system where black folks coming out of slavery didn't own the land. Uh, they worked the land. They, like, rented the land. And whenever the crop came in at the end of the year, they would total up with the landowner, and the goal was that they would make some profit at the end of the year. But sharecropping was a system where they never got out of debt, uh, and they had to maintain on that, on that piece of property until they paid off the landowner. And, of course, lynching, probably the most troubling of all aspects of Jim Crow. And lynching is nothing more than mass sanctioned murder. And a quick Google search, if you Google lynching photography, believe me, you will see uh, more lynching photographs than you can stomach. All right, so now World War I rolls around, and, and black folk... Uh, do not like the conditions in the South. So World War I rolls around, white men are all fighting, and so what you have in the North now, you have a labor shortage. White men drafted to the military, going to fight in World War I, but now what you need, you need men to work in industry. And many of you all know that whenever the U.S. went to war, uh, some industries would convert to wartime production. So I'll just give an example. If you, if you were Levi Strauss, instead of you making jeans for the general public, you would make military uniforms. If you were a food manufacturer, instead of making food for grocery stores, you would make food for the military. Uh, Boeing Airplane, that's a, a later development. During World War II, they would stop making planes for the general public, and they would make planes for the military. So you have all these factories now that need workers. And so many white business owners would come to the South. They would take out ads and African-American newspapers, and they would recruit African-Americans to go from the South to the North to work. Now, understand this. If you were living in uh, Greenwood, Mississippi, you may make a dollar a day picking cotton. But imagine getting an ad, seeing an ad somewhere or going to your church and somebody telling you, well, if you come to Chicago, Cleveland, or Detroit, you can make uh, $10, $20 a week. So understand a lot of black folk went North uh, again, chasing jobs. But check this out. 
if you are a white Southern landowner, you probably wouldn't get too excited about uh, seeing all these black folk leave because that is your labor force. And so right before World War I and World War II, during those periods, white Southerners tried a variety of methods to keep black people in the South. One way they did it well, they, is through laws. Uh, they would say, well, you can't leave the county unless you owe somebody, if you owe somebody money. And since many of these folks were sharecropping, they had to stay there until they paid off their debt. Another way they keep, kept people from leaving was through intimidation. Sometimes they would tell the husband, I heard you trying to go to Chicago. If you go to Chicago, I'm going to kick your family off the land the day you leave. And the third way they kept black folks in the South was through violence. Uh, there are times where, where, where whites would show up at train stations with guns in their hand, forcing black people off trains and forcing them back to their rural areas to get back in the field. So even when black folk wanted to leave, there were things in place that sort of kept them there. Um, when you talk about the Great Migration around World War I, you're talking about one million black people, one million black people leaving Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Arkansas, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, and I'm probably missing one or two states, but the deep south states, that's where they are leaving. And they are going to uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Chicago, Illinois, Detroit, Michigan, Gary, Indiana, Cleveland, Ohio, New York City, Boston, Philadelphia. That is primarily where they're going on time of World War I. Now, if any of you all ever been to North, you may see a, a church that says um, Greater Mount Zion Baptist Church or Second Baptist Church. Often, that was a result of, let's, I'm going to use the Greenwood, Mississippi example. If I'm a pastor in Greenwood, Mississippi, and I'm pastoring Mount Zion Baptist Church in Greenwood, Mississippi, if I see my congregation going to Chicago, Cleveland, and Detroit, I got two choices. I can stay there and have nobody to pastor, or I can follow my congregation up north, and that's what a lot of pastors did. So you may see, it may say like Greater Mount Zion Baptist Church, number two, Chicago, Illinois, but the original church would be in Mississippi, Louisiana, or Alabama, and that just shows you how things operate. Now, the way a lot of black Southerners communicate with people up north, it was through African-American newspapers, and this is where many white business owners would take out ads in black-owned newspapers, um, and that's how they would know about all the opportunities to work in Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee, Gary, Indiana, whatever, things of that nature. All right, so that is sort of Great Migration number one. Prior to the Great Migration, many of these northern cities had a population, uh, one, two, three percent African-American prior to the Great Migration during World War I. After World War I, these cities would be roughly 10 percent black. Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago are going to be roughly 10% black after World War I. So still a very, very small population. And many of these folks who migrated around the time of World War I talked about how much they enjoyed being in the North. They, in many ways, called it the promised land. All right? Now, let's get to World War II. Now, the World War II piece is critical because this is what explains the modern-day ghetto. It explains the hood. It explains, in many ways, a lot of the conditions we see today. I tell my students all the time that the present is a product of the past. Um, so World War II jumps, opens up in 1941. And so again, you have this desire for jobs. But between 1941 and 1965, what will make this migration different, you got three million black folk leaving. You have three million black folk leaving in a roughly two decade period. They go to Boston, New York, uh, Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, Milwaukee, Gary, St. Louis, places like that, Minneapolis. But what makes the World War II migration interesting is that now they start to go to the West Coast in large numbers. Los Angeles, Oakland, San Francisco, Seattle, and Portland. Uh, a lot of the folks who went to California, Texas. Texas had a strong migration to California um, because of the weather, and it was just a straight shot from Texas to California. Uh, also, the Bay Area, uh, Oakland, San Francisco, and also Seattle. Um, so that's what will make the second great migration much bigger because you, people are now migrating to uh, California. Um, so you got three million black folk who leave. They are fleeing, lynching, can't vote, all that kind of stuff. But here is what is different. When they got to the North, unlike their counterparts during World War I, they encountered significant 
uh, issues of racism in four areas. Number one, uh, police brutality. Number two, education. Number three, employment. And number four, housing. Those are the four issues, police brutality, education, employment, and housing. And that was 50, 60, 70 years ago. These are the four issues black folks still with, deal with today. And so let's deal with one initially. Now, let's deal with um, housing initially. When black folk migrated to the North in World War II, they were not allowed to move to white areas. They were not allowed to move to white areas. So what you had were black folks going into already overcrowded black communities. And what what was created over time were ghetto-like conditions. This is when you see start to see housing projects being built, 15, 16, 17-story housing projects. They begin to just warehouse black people because they were not allowed to move to white-owned areas. Now, you're asking, how come they weren't allowed to move to white-owned areas? I'm glad you asked. Number one, bank redlining. Um, many, many banks had policies. They would not give loans to African Americans to move to white areas. And the phrase redlining is significant because what many bankers did, they would draw a red line around black areas of the city, and they would tell loan officers, if anybody applies for a loan from these zip codes, you immediately deny it. No matter the work history, credit report, how much money they have, you immediately deny it. And so, number one, black folks were not allowed to uh, purchase homes in, uh, in previously white areas. Number two... There were some communities, some communities that passed laws that said we will have no public transportation in our community. So again, that keeps people out. Other municipalities said that you know you can you you are not allowed to have more than two generations of the same family living in the house. Now, how does that impact us? Often we'll have a grandparent living with us. Mm -hmm. So that was against the law someplace. So a lot of these laws just kept black people in richly confined all black areas. So housing. Uh, was, was the first issue. The second issue, police brutality. I'm going to stop you yes. real quick, um, Dr. Moore. Folks, um, remember that you can ask questions using the question and answer field. Um, we can so, make it interactive, that's what you want to do. Well, we're going to go fine. back and forth. Okay, that's we're going to go back and forth. Okay. So with housing, mm -hmm. how does that, so that housing, that redlining mm -hmm. aspect, which I think most of our viewers and listeners may have heard of at one particular point in time, has that actually taken us to some of our wealth gaps Absolutely. that exist today Absolutely. and that still impact black families and right. definitely impact the families that are being served the human service right. organization? Are most of your listeners from the state of Texas? Yes. So I'll, I'll use a, I'm going to use a Dallas example. I don't know if anybody's ever been in the Highland Park neighborhood in Dallas. It's right around SMU. If you've ever been on the North Dallas Tollway, it's that community about five minutes outside of downtown where it has the sound barriers up. That's how you know it's a wealthy community when they have sound barriers. So let's take, for example, let's say 1950, my mom wanted to buy a house in Highland Park, Texas. So let's say that that house in Highland Park in 1950 cost $80,000, all right? Let's say they were not allowed to buy there and they were told, well, you got to go to Oak Cliff or somewhere in South Dallas to buy a house. So let's say the house we bought Oak Cliff was worth $20,000. That house in Highland Park that somebody bought for $80,000 in 1950 right now may be worth about $2.2 .2 million. That house in Oak Cliff that was bought for $20,000 in 1950 may be worth max $300,000. So you're talking about a significant wealth gap. And, and in America, most people initially get their wealth through property. Chris Rock tells a joke. He said that at one point, him, Jay-Z, and Mary J. Blige all lived in the same cul-de-sac in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And there was one white guy there, and he was a dentist, all right? And he was just talking about how, you know, all of them were millionaires, but their, but their white neighbor was a dentist. And I think a lot of black middle class people see that very well educated, physicians, attorneys, professionals, engineers, blah, 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 you know, double income, making great money. But sometimes our white neighbors have no education. You know, you know, you, you, you know, I mean, you may live next to somebody who's a librarian and maybe a state trooper, and you're wondering, well, how did they afford a house for four hundred five thousand dollars five thousand dollars? Because the issue is a lot of them inherited wealth from parents. And a lot of wealth in America is initially generated 
through real estate. The real estate wealth helps people start businesses, real estate wealth, and many because you can leverage it. You know what I mean? So so that is a great question you asked about the the, the, the wealth gap, and a lot of it goes back to uh, redlining. Mm -hmm. And how does that tie into the current day conversation around gentrification? It's, it's, it's a good thing you asked that, and we're seeing gentrification in Dallas now, parts of Houston, and of course, Austin. Um, it is all connected. Here's what I remind people. Folks who live in the inner city have, have always demanded an improvement in city services. They wanted better schools. They wanted better police protection. They wanted infrastructure. They never got it. However, when developers want to come in and buy the land, they are guaranteed, well, if you do this, we will, we will build the infrastructure. If you do this, we will make sure. I've seen school, school districts manipulate boundaries to make sure that parents moving into gentrifying areas, that their kids will be able to go to school by themselves. And they won't have to, they won't have to interact with the general, with everybody else in the neighborhood. I've seen all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah, so it's very well, very much so connected. Wow. And uh, what's interesting is I've actually heard of what you just said occurring here in Austin in the recent let, months as well. Let me give you a story. Uh, you know what that Mueller development is in Austin? I do. So me and my wife moved here in 2007. We went and looked at some houses in Mueller. And for those who aren't, you know, know what Mueller is. Mueller is about a mile from UT's campus. It's the old site of the um, old Austin airport. And we just went there and looked at some houses. We got on a mailing list because they were building there. And we got an email and said, come out and meet the school superintendent. So they, these parents had enough cap, social capital to get the school superintendent to come to somebody's house on a Sunday afternoon to meet with prospective home, home buyers, assuring them that if you all move here, you all will have your own elementary school. Yes. So those of you out there in virtual land cannot see my face as I am extremely shocked by the possibility that this all ties together. Absolutely. And the power that is there through basically coming through the practices from World War II, after World War II. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. We have a question for you from Lori who says, what is meant by sound barrier? Sound barriers is, is um, if you're on the highway, um, the, the tollway, um, where it's just big walls, and basically wealthy communities have the social capital to say, you know, this highway is making too much noise. We want you to put up those are sound barriers. It's not just so people can't see in their backyard; it's to keep the sound out. But you typically only see those around wealthy areas. <laughs> so I would say that if you live in the Austin area and you're driving down Mopac and right. wondering why the construction won't stop. It won't yes. stop because people want sound barriers built along right. the Clarksville, I cannot remember that other neighborhood, right. but along that line. West Austin. Right. West Austin. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Let's see, we have another one. Uh, they also call it a sound wall. Paul Busby says they just built some on Mopad. Mm -hmm. Loessa, I hope I'm saying the name right, do you believe that taxes used to keep African Americans in the South during the Great Migration are embedded in the current social service system? If so, give examples. Uh, I need to explain a bit. No, I mean, I, I need to understand the question a little bit more. I'm sorry. All right. Loetta, can you send a uh, elaboration? For that, please. I'm thinking what you may be asking is those tactics of violence, coercion that Dr. Moore mentioned earlier. Does he believe that those are currently being used in our social service system? I think that's what she's asking. Are we using, still using some of those same tactics? that were used to keep African-Americans in the South that you mentioned earlier? Are we still using those? All right. She just said yes. Right. <laughs> so how are those, I, I'm gonna reword that a little yeah. bit, Ms. Allen. 
how are those tactics embedded into our systems through institutional racism? I mean, don't, don't are we, we still holding black people down in our system? And can those tactics from then be compared to the tactics today? No, I would, I would, I wouldn't draw a parallel. Now she may draw a parallel. I wouldn't draw a parallel between the two. All right. <laughs> I mean, I think there was a economic need, economic motive to keep black folks in the South. I think if black folk wanted to leave now, I don't think anybody would be trying to keep them there. You know, but I think there was a need. You know, we got these, we got these large pieces, pieces of land. This cotton got to be picked and all that kind of stuff. You all can't leave. So I would make connection between the two. Okay. So with that, you were going on to your Tell next. Tell us about police brutality. Let me do a police brutality. And the reason police brutality is such a big issue now in the black community, because this is sort of the one issue that, that you know, that kind of uh, – Police brutality, I would argue, is the only issue that potentially affects every single African American, regardless of your skin color, regardless of your income, regardless of where you live, regardless of your educational level, regardless of your status. This is the one thing that affects everybody. And so, for instance, poor schools don't because if I'm, if I'm black and I got some money, my kids are in a good school. I may sympathize that there are black kids in poor schools, but that doesn't affect me on a daily basis. You know what I mean? So... The root of police brutality uh, is that uh, during World War II, many police departments in the North, as the black community got larger, they would specifically go to the Deep South to recruit white police officers because they felt they knew best how to deal with the black population, all right? Um, and for many white police officers in the South, they had a lot of day-to-day -day interactions with African American, uh, with African Americans in the South. So, the term police brutality is an all-encompassing term. It means on one end, police murder or police homicide, all the way to the other end, just harassment of an African American. So, during this time period, if you look at any African American newspaper, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, New York City, Minneapolis, um, Madison, Wisconsin, Gary, Indiana, St. Louis, most of these are weekly black newspapers, you will literally see an incident of police brutality on the front page every single week of every single newspaper. So the, the problem of police brutality in the black community has been going on since the late 1800s. It has been one of the most persistent issues affecting African Americans, all right? And so the root of the issue was, you know, um, uh, black people were, you know, all presumed to be criminals. Um, you had very few African Americans on the police force, and then the African Americans you did have on the force, they weren't in any kind of supervisory position at all. And so you just have a system where a majority white police force now is now has to handle a city that is becoming more and more blacker, I would say, all right? So let me say this. When we talk about World War II, Michael, you're talking about 3 million black folks moving to the North. So here's how those cities were affected, affected. So if the black population in Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago was 10% at the end of Great Migration, one, at the end of the Second Great Migration, these cities would now be a third African American, 30, 35, some places 40%, because as black people are moving into the city, white people are moving out. And we call that white flight. They're moving out to the suburbs. And not only are they moving out and buying new homes in the suburbs, but they're taking their businesses with them. So it's white flight, both residential and commercial. So police brutality would be a persistent issue. Now, for my parents out there, let's deal with education. And I argue this all the time. Um, I don't think African-American parents, uh, I think if you ask most African-American parents during this time period, they wanted their children to be taught by African-American teachers. And so um, one of the issues that would really blow up would be over the educational system, because since black people now are moving into all black areas, these black schools become severely overcrowded. Because remember, they can't move to white areas. So the schools in the white community would be under-enrolled significantly, but schools in the black community are sometimes off operating at twice the capacity. It got so bad that in many cities, um, black kids had to go to school on the relay system, meaning you went to school either in the morning for three and a half hours or you went to school in the afternoon for three and a half hours. 
Now understand this, you're only getting three and a half hours of education, but your white counterparts are getting six and a half hours of education. But this was allowed by state boards of education because um, it was allowed because um, they felt that was the quickest way to solve the issue and they didn't want to integrate white schools, okay? So here is where black parents start to have a lot of complaints because although these schools are majority black, the teaching force is going to be primarily all white. Here are some of the complaints parents had. Number one, number one, there were no black teachers. Second complaint, um, they felt their kids weren't getting a quality education. Third complaint, um, they felt a lot of the, the, the white teachers were, were saying that black kids had learning disabilities. And the black parents were like, no, my child doesn't have a disability. You just can't teach, all right? Fourth complaint, curriculum materials that made no mention of the black experience whatsoever. And the fifth complaint, school overcrowding, school overcrowding. And so this is where you begin to see, we talk, people talk about the, 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 the public school crisis. This is where you see sort of the beginning of it here during the second great migration. And last, let's talk about employment for a minute, employment. Now, although black folks initially came for jobs during World War II, the research shows that as we were coming to the North for jobs, that factories were actually closing down as we were coming, all right? And many of you heard the phrase the Rust Belt, right? And Rust Belt means these cities like Cleveland, Chicago, that were manufacturing hubs, you know, the, the, the factories closed down and, and, the, and the equipment begins to rust. So black folks dealt with significant employment discrimination. Uh, black women dealt with the stereotype of having an attitude, right? They said black women were difficult to get along with. They had attitudes. And so as a result of that, black women weren't given jobs commensurate with their level of training and expertise. Secondly, black men were perceived as being lazy and incompetent. So again, they weren't given jobs commensurate with their level of expertise and training. So as we were coming into jobs in the factories, a lot of us were getting the lowest paid jobs and the most dangerous jobs in the factory. So when we talk about the, 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 the World War II, the, the, the second great migration, housing, police community relations, education, and employment are, very, are four significant issues such that that would give rise to the Black Power Movement. Because unlike in the Deep South, during the Civil Rights Movement, where, where, where you had two visible goals, the right to vote and the end segregation, that was the movement in the South. So that's, it's not easy, but you know what, you know what, you know what a victory is. Once we get the right to vote, and once we get segregation outlaw, we're successful. Up north, it was different because it wasn't de jure segregation, meaning segregation by law. It was more de facto, D-E space F-A-C-T-O. De facto means by custom or just by tradition. So up north, you, you know, you migrated from the south. You're in Chicago. You're in Detroit. But you're living in the ghetto. Your kids got kicked out of school. You can't get a job. You're dealing with police brutality, it leads to frustration. So this gives rise to Malcolm X, who would be the voice of black folks in the North, whereas King is gonna be, gonna be the voice of black folks in the South because they are dealing with a visible, uh, they are dealing with a visible barrier, the lack of voting and Jim Crow. But up North is gonna be different. So the black power movement rises out of this, out of this frustration in the North. And so Malcolm X, the Nation of Islam, the Black Panthers and other organizations would speak to that black frustration of black folks who had migrated from Louisiana to Oakland. Hmm. It's like, well, we dealt with this in Louisiana. It's like, well, hell, we still deal with this in Oakland. You know what I mean? The laws on the books say you could vote. It says you're integrated. It says no, there's no employment discrimination, but your day-to-day -day reality. And it would lead some to be very discouraging because if I left Mississippi, where my, where my family was, right, and where my people are buried and where, you know, my, my DNA is in the soil, and I moved to Cleveland, Ohio, where it's cold, and I'm told that when I get up here, I'm going to be able to get a great job and things are going to be a lot different, only to find out that it wasn't a lot different. Um, I'm, I tell people I'm, I'm a child of the Great Migration. My dad is from uh, Indianapolis, raised in Cleveland, but my mom is from Louisiana. So when they got married in 1959 in Louisiana, my mom came from a very a vibrant black community our side of New Orleans where a lot of the black folk owned their own land, they owned businesses. My mom's whole world was in three square miles, all right? 
And I said, well, Mom, what was it like when you moved to Cleveland after, you know, when y'all got married and you, and you went to Cleveland to be with Dad? She said, when I went there the first time, she said, I said to myself, these people don't have anything. She didn't understand apartment living. <laughs> you know, she understood having a house on 20 acres of land. And so she didn't understand all the poverty. And in her mind, she was like, why would people choose to live like this? So that's what gives rise to a lot of the black frustration. And I think even now when you see the Black Lives Matter piece, what we're dealing with now is the legacy of the second great migration uh, and a lot of the hidden racism that black folks found when they moved. Interesting. So I want to expound on this concept you just mentioned, hidden racism. Today, when you're talking to students, when you're talking to individuals about institutional racism and other forms of racism that exist today, would you still describe it as, for a lot of people, hidden racism? Some have even described it as, we dealt with the voting and the segregation and whether black people could sit at the front of the bus versus the back of the bus. Uh -huh. Believing that those were the only main forms of racism that we needed to deal with. In today, 2019, hidden racism, and I really do like that term. Yeah. Are we still getting blindsided by hidden racism? Let, let me tell you one thing I, what I appreciate about being in Texas, and people, people laugh at me for this. Um, I found that I can have the conversation I can have, the conversations I can have in Texas with particularly some of my white colleagues and white friends and white neighbors over race is a lot more refreshing than I ever had in Cleveland, Ohio. And I'll tell you what I mean. I mean, I'll have people say crazy stuff to me. You know what I mean? Particularly, I'm in this role at UT where it says diversity. That alarms people. I gave a, I was invited to go to a very wealthy neighborhood to speak to about 80, 90 men, very wealthy. Um, and when, uh, now they invited me now. When the speaker read my bio, some people got up and walked out. I, 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 I can appreciate that. And when I was talking, and I was sure, I said, I'm going to give this lecture. I'm not, I'm not going to say anything about race. This ain't nothing about race. I talk about globalization. The first question that was asked, now I didn't say, I talked about globalization. The first question that was asked, a man raised his hand. He said, well, Dr. Moore, can you, um, can you tell us about Black Lives Matter? All right? And so I, I explained, and then he said, well, and I'm quoting now, if you all would just obey the police, you wouldn't get shot. Now, I appreciate him being honest and being straightforward. Because unless we can have those straightforward conversations, nothing can ever get done. So he gave his perspective. I said, let me give you mine. I said, do you think on my bio that I've done everything America has asked me to do? He said, he said yes, Dr. Moore, but I, yeah, you went to school, all that. I said, well, I'm going to just tell you about my interactions with the police. And here's the deal. Just like I validated your feelings, I need you to validate mine. And when I told him, sometimes when I get on I-35 and a police officer gets behind me, sometimes I get nervous because of my history with the police. And so my point is, when people come at you like that, it allows, I believe, we can have more frank discussions about it. But we can't be so sensitive when somebody comes at us and says something crazy, we can't get offended. We got to be like, elaborate on that a little bit. Let me know your perspective, because that's not my perspective. And that's what I appreciate about being a detective. Wow. And I'm going to tell you that one of the reasons I'm surprised by that, especially as someone living here in Austin, uh -huh. is this notion that Austin, in terms of hidden racism, has often been described as being at the top of that list due to an inability of people or an unwillingness of people to have those transparent conversations yeah. in a city that calls itself liberal mm -hmm. and progressive. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. But I do agree with you about the notion of we have to have the conversation. Absolutely. And we have to have people on both sides Absolutely. speaking their truth right. I, let me with example. transparency. After the Trump election, me and my wife, we live in a cul-de-sac in Round Rock. After the Trump election, uh, seven families, one Indian family, 
me and my wife, African American family, uh, family from Iran. And so we invited all the neighbors to our house after the Trump election. Here's what we said. We said, I believe y'all cool people. I believe y'all would look out for me. I believe if I needed some money, y'all would give me some. Help me understand. I'm just trying to understand, not passing judgment. Help me understand um, the fascination with Trump. And one of my neighbors said, he said, Leonard, I'll be honest with you. He said, Leonard, he, he sells pharmaceuticals. He said, Leonard, I was told by my boss that since I'm not a woman and I'm not black or Latino, that, that he said, Leonard, I was told I wasn't going to get promoted anymore. And he said, Leonard, that is my frustration. I understand black people have been treated bad. He said, but Leonard, what did I have to do with that? And, 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 and I tell people I appreciate his honesty. Mm. You know, he said, Leonard, I think some of these affirmative action, I think some of these programs, he said, quite frankly, as a white man, I feel like I get discriminated against. And so what I had to do was understand him. I couldn't say that's crazy. I had to understand his feelings. And I think when we can begin to understand, not saying you got to agree, but begin to understand both sides, I think we can have some, some legitimate discussion. All right. Thank you. Miss Allen, oh, we have two questions. Miss Thomas says, what is the solution? Do you feel we as black people should unite resources and build our own community? That's, I do believe we have a history of what has happened over time when black people have built their own community. <laughs> well, I think, you know, uh, uh, I don't know about, you know, separating ourselves. I don't think that's going to work. I think we're too, integra in, we're too integrated into the fabric of America. And I don't, I don't think we need to separate anything. I think black folk got a right to be here just like anybody else. But I think the one opportunity we have missed, I think we are letting too much land go in the South, particularly those of us who have grandparents out in the country, rural Texas, rural Louisiana, rural Mississippi. I always tell my students, when you go home for Thanksgiving, ask your oldest relative, where's the family land at? And, you know, but a lot of young people, they don't want to go to the country. They don't want to go out there. They say it's boring. But what is happening, black people are losing that land. And some of us are losing it because the taxes aren't being paid. You know what I mean? And the mm -hmm. taxes don't get paid two or three years. Somebody is waiting on the courthouse steps to that property is sold. Then the next time you go out to the country, that property is being owned by somebody else. So I really think if we got back to this tradition of land ownership, um, I tell people, my grandmother, um, uh, she lived, she was 94 years of age, had a very peaceful life, uh, had about 80 acres of land, got up every morning at 5 a.m., when I, I, I laugh at Whole Foods because we used to have that in our backyard. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Go kill the hog, go yes. pick some collard greens, go get those tomatoes, you know what I mean? And how yes. organic is that, you know? Yes. Um, but I think we've gotten away from that because all of us want to move to the city. I understand wanting to live in Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, but it may not be a bad idea for some of us who are able to go out into these rural areas and buy, you know, a few acres of land and, and, and begin to build up that... Um, begin to, 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 you know, have something in our family's name for, for generations to come. It's very interesting that you say that. Recently, I've been having conversations with friends of mine who has, who has family in Macon, Georgia, mm -hmm. and my mother, my grandmother is from Pittsview, Alabama. Okay, wow. And we've had those conversations about yeah. that land uh -huh. and holding on to that land. And I think you're right. Our generation has very much been about do away with the land, right. sell the land, get the money now, right. instead of thinking about long-term wealth That's right. and That's land right. ownership. That's right. yeah, so I don't know if you ever watched this movie, the TV show called Queen Sugar. Yes. It is a great show. I, I, I think it comes on Oprah's Network own, oh, yes. but it is a great movie about, um, you know, an African-American family outside of New Orleans, you know, trying to hang on to all to, to a ton of land uh, in this sugar-growing region of Louisiana. And that's a great movie that deals with what you're talking about. Yes. And for those of you who don't have cable like me, it's also on Hulu. Okay. Miss <laughs> you know. Allen says, is it truly hidden, especially, I believe she's asking about the racism, especially since we can call it out? Or when we say hidden, are we being gracious and allowing ignorance to abound without accountability? Let, let me say this. I think, I think saying somebody is racist, that's really harsh to call somebody racist. I think, I think, I think, um, uh, I think prejudice may be a better word. Sometimes people are looking out for their own self-interest. Um, 
Um, so I don't know if, 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 because I truly believe if you go into a firm downtown and there are no black or Latino employees, okay, or no women in leadership, this may sound crazy. I don't think they, I don't think they deliberately say we're going to hire any black people, no women in leadership, we're going to hire by Latino. I think what most people do is just operate from within their circle. Does that make sense? And even me being in leadership position, I have to make sure that I don't just operate within my circle because if that's the case, I mean, I run in black middle class circles, you know what I mean? And so I think it's we need to get people to begin to operate outside their circle. And operating within that circle, would you agree that oftentimes that comes in the hiring process under that term, good fit? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, most people hire people they know, hire people they're comfortable with, um, and hire people who, you know, who, who in many ways are like them. You know, most managers, if you aren't careful, you will hire yourself. <laughs> but you're right. That term, good fit, it does, um, it does lead to people being excluded. Yeah. So I want to take us back for a moment to police brutality. That is a conversation that I think is on everyone's mind. And when they think of Black Lives Matter, they think of police brutality. When you stated that in the weekly Black newspapers, every week, every week, every week there was an incident. Every week. Is that any different than today? I can go to Twitter, I can go to Instagram, I can go to Facebook, and I will see an instant, and probably more so today, more graphic, because I can watch the entire video, which is damaging to the black psyche in and of itself. Right. We haven't moved. We're still watching these images. So what is the solution to police brutality? How do we move, for lack of a better phrase, the needle on this particular issue? Because you've even stated it's the most pervasive one and may actually even be one of our systems that has not had any right. major reform. Let, let me say this. Uh, I have a lot of respect for police officers. It is a hard job. Uh, and as someone who had a, one of my childhood friends, Derek Owens, he was killed. He was a police officer. Derek was, what, 28, 29? Uh, he was killed uh, by a drug dealer over $40, $40 a week, you know. So understand, I understand the job police officers is very hard. And when you talk to officers, if you ever seen that movie, um, I think it's The Hate You Give or something like that, Common Plays a Police Officer, I think the movie does a good job of explaining from a police officer perspective, every time I stop somebody, there's a part of me that fears for my life. So I completely understand that. And I think it's also good for us to understand that 99.9% .9 of all police officers are great, are great. It's the one <laughs> who seems to have influence over so many others, you know what I mean, that is the problem. So I, I don't want to cast all, I mean, all of them are great. Um, the issue is we need to train police better. And one thing that was done when African-American mayor, when African-Americans started becoming mayors of cities, in the late 60s and early 70s, the one thing they did, they started requiring new police cadets to learn something about the communities in which they would be serving. What happens now, so much of the training is about rules and regulations, but it's like, no, help me understand the community. You know, what is the black community? What, what issues are they dealing with? What issues are Latinos dealing with? And I took my son and his friends up to the Round Rock um, um, uh, police department, uh, just like for a meet and greet uh, about two, two or three years ago, and it was very beneficial. And the, the police officer said, he said, well, Mr. Moore, you know, when we tell a kid to stop, they need to stop. And I said, officer, I understand that, but can you understand from a black or Latino kid's perspective that if they haven't done anything wrong and you tell them to stop and they keep running, they're not trying to disrespect you. They're just scared. Because in their mind, also, they haven't done anything. And so me and the officer had a, a very interesting conversation about that for 15 minutes. And I, and, and I told the officer, say, officer, for, many, for my son and his friends, they've seen their dads get pulled over. And their dad's friends get pulled over for doing nothing. So they initially will be scared. And so I think when police officers can begin to understand the history of law enforcement uh, in certain communities, 
And number two, more specifically the issue with black and Latino boys in the police, I think we can have some progress. Um, I asked the, the school resource officer at my son's middle school in Round Rock, and I said, uh, I said, I need you to be intentional about reaching out to the black and Latino boys in the school. He said, well, Leonard, I don't see color. I said, well, yes, you do. <laughs> I said, but you need to understand that their experience with law enforcement has been different than their white classmates. Things like that, I think, will, will, will help them to a certain degree. We have a couple of questions yeah. online. Uh -huh. I also have one for you. Uh -huh. So you talk about in the North as part of black migration, the North going to the South and bring police officers from the South. Absolutely. With that, I would assume that that means they also brought their anti-black, anti-brown bias with them. Absolutely. Which then pretty much cements it mm -hmm. into the criminal justice system, into law enforcement. Absolutely. If that is the case, mm -hmm. how do you deal with that? What is a solution in addition to training mm -hmm. How do we deal with the anti-black, anti-brown sentiment that appears to be inherent in law enforcement from the time of black migration and before? Well, if I had to answer that, I'd, I'd be wealthy. But I think, number one, it, it, it requires courageous leadership, uh, number one. And number two, um, I think you have to remember you know, that as a race of people, uh, African Americans have been criminalized. I mean, that's 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 been since since we've been here, you know, we, we, we've been criminalized. Um, and I don't know how you, I don't know how you really undo that. You know, even me and myself, I find myself uh, doing things subconsciously so people won't perceive me to be a criminal. Mm -hmm. You know, like if I have to take something back to a store, I make sure it's in the original bag and I make sure I have the receipt and people like, well, you know, but some of my, White friends, they, they may not have the bag, may not have the receipt. And I'm like, I can't do that because then they may assume that I stole the item. And so, so even subconsciously, you know, this idea of being labeled a criminal, I think it affects us in, in ways we don't even realize. Okay. Ms. Allen is asking, how do we practice addressing racism in the four areas you mentioned? How do we teach our counterparts who, not, who may not be as educated or articulate how to advocate for themselves. So, uh, that's Ms. Allen's name? Ms. Allen. Ms. Allen, okay. Let, let me say this, Ms. Allen. Um, I do a lot of diversity training, um, but my approach is a little different, all right? Some people take diversity training as, 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 a, as a moral issue, it's the right thing to do. Some people take it as a social justice issue. Um, I take it as an aspirational issue. Let me tell you what I mean. Ms. Allen, I teach two classes at UT, a class called the Black Power Movement and a class called Race in the Age of Trump, combined enrollment of 1,000 students. And when I ask people, well, how many white students do you think I have out of those 1,000, you know, uh, one person said maybe three students, maybe 10. No, I have 600. And my approach has been um, too often when we want to have trainings, uh, we point the finger at all white people. You're bad. You're racist, you're prejudiced, you stereotype us, blah, blah, blah. Most people don't learn that way. You know, if I walk into a training as a man talking about around gender and sexuality, and they just say, well, you're sexist, blah, 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 I will probably get defensive and I won't be open to learning. What I realize is that it has to be aspirational. And so what I do with a lot of my students, I tell them point blank, you don't have to like anybody. You don't have to like anybody. You don't have to like anybody gay, nobody transgender, nobody... Latino, nobody black, nobody Asian, but you better learn how to get along with them. And the one example I always give, I ask some of my um, white business students here at UT, if you go get that job on Wall Street and you have no interaction, you know nothing about the black experience, and you just hate Black Lives Matter because it doesn't make sense to you, what are you going to do if I'm your boss and on your first day of work, there's a big old Black Lives Matter sticker on my desk? Are you going to quit? And so what I tell students is that Black studies courses, Mexican-American studies courses, all these courses, white students benefit from them because we have done them a disservice because we are bringing them up and training them 
not to be competitive in an increasingly multiracial and diverse world. Let me give you an example. I was up in Northeast Texas talking to a group of uh, school board members, about 100 of them. There were two black people in the building, me and the guy who invited me. And I made the, I made the statement that they should require, as a, as a high school graduation requirement, every student should be required to be fluent in Spanish when they graduate. They got big uproar. No, Dr. Moore, they need to learn, you know, uh, immigrants need to learn the language, blah, blah, blah. And I said, let me ask you a question. I said, how many of y'all own a business? A couple raise their hand. I said, if you have two people applying for a job, same level of expertise, same level of training, same level of experience, one is bilingual and one is not, who are you going to hire? And they said the bilingual one. And I said, so that is why, so even people want to be critical of diversity training and all that kind of stuff. It helps everybody, you know, and it helps my white students because now when they take my class and some other classes, now they feel comfortable if their best job offer is on the east side of Cleveland, the west side of Detroit, a part of Oakland, south central L.A., they know I'm white, but I know I can operate because I know the experience and I know, I know, and I know, the, I know the viewpoint, uh, I know the viewpoints of the community. So that's, I've, I've been stressing that for 22 years. And does it also mean that they then also understand the concept of, concept of white privilege and how that fits into their daily existence? Absolutely. Absolutely. Ms. Russ, mm -hmm. this is a little long. Okay. Are we as blacks obligated to teach non-blacks about our culture? I feel this is something that happens way too often. I believe we have to demand non-blacks educate themselves on our culture. Just as we have had to do on other culture, I do understand some of this is ignorance and how people are raised, but I believe we live in a world where there is so much technology whereby this information can be accessed. Do you have an obligation? No, but should you do it? Yes. Because if you don't do it, then who will? And then we talk about them going to get self-educated. What if they get it the wrong way? So whenever I am asked to go speak to a group, I always go. And I, I, I consider, I, I'm excited because they want to learn. And when you invite me, I can give it to you the way I want to give it to you. And so, but in a perfect world, you know, should, should every black person have that burden? Absolutely not. But if people are truly desired to want to learn, people have a true desire to learn, um, let's by all means take that opportunity and tell them about our experiences. Miss Allen said she was smiling that earlier you answered what she was trying to ask okay. in the first question. Okay. <laughs> Inadvertently, but you answered it. So my next question for you is, in the 1970s, my understanding is we began to experience sort of a reverse migration, where black people started going back to the South. Uh -huh. What would cause black people to turn around mm -hmm and go back to the South that they fled, was it the hidden racism that they weren't expecting to experience in the North? Or was it economic reasons? What, I, I what made it, us turn around? I think the broader answer, the bigger answer is quality of life. I mean, I think the factory's closed. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The factory's closed. I, I, I have, still have family in Cleveland. I'm like, why y'all still there? You know what I mean? The factory's closed. Cost of living is high. And I think people begin to realize that, hey, you know, maybe it's time to go back where we're from. Cost of living is going to be cheaper in the South. The weather, the weather is nicer. Um, property is a lot cheaper, things of that nature. So I think that's what you, you know, I think you, you're beginning to see that. More and more people are saying, okay, you know, we've been, you know, uh, you know, living in these urban environments for six, seven, eight years. Let's go back to the South. Yeah. Now, I don't find people going back to the rural South as much, but mm -hmm. you do see them going to some of these outlying suburban communities outside Atlanta, you know, parts of South Carolina, Louisiana, Mississippi, things of that nature, yeah. Okay, so they weren't going back to the rural South. Maybe, they were going to hot Atlanta and places. Right, I mean, they'll go to the rural South to retire. And, you know, even a lot of my mom's family did that. You know, they would go buy a house back down, down home and often split their time between Louisiana and Cleveland or Louisiana and Detroit, things of that nature. But having a desire to spend their last years back where it all began in the Deep South. Very interesting today's conversation. We've been talking about the black migration, how it started, 
the impact of it, the disparities related to institutional racism. Yet we're here in 2019, and there is this constant conversation about Black people getting over it. Yeah. Yet in this discussion, you've been able to tie these two together, that those same disparities mm -hmm. are the same disparities that we're having today. When you talk about education, overcrowding mm -hmm. in um, urban schools are still there. You talked about special ed. We know that African-American children are still being placed in special ed classes. We know that there is discrepancies in disciplinary rate. Mm -hmm. What's your response when people are not able to connect history to the present and continue to tell people of color, get over it? I understand because they haven't been taught. I mean, what I love about the classes I teach, and I, you know, my Black Power class, 500 something students, one semester I had about 10 older UT alum just come sit in the class. These white um, uh, couples in their 70s. They came every Tuesday and Thursday, the entire 90 minutes. And they said it was so fascinating to them, they said, Dr. Moore, I never knew. And that's what a lot of my white students say. They never know the history. When would, when would they have been exposed to it? <laughs> so a lot of them are just speaking out of their ignorance because they don't know. But I think when you when they begin to read and they begin to learn and begin to study, it just blows them away. I had one mom, she didn't want her, student, her daughter to take my class. So what she did was she got a copy of the syllabus, she bought all the books, and every day after class, her, 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 her daughter would send her the class notes and they would discuss it. Do you know halfway through the semester, that mom became a big advocate for teaching white kids about the black experience because she said she felt so ignorant about it. Yeah, so mm -hmm. they don't know. So I don't get frustrated when they say get over it because in their mind, if you, if you look at the Dallas Morning News, the New Orleans Times speaking these are white papers, Dallas Morning News, Times speaking New Orleans, the Klan legend Jackson, Mississippi, the big paper in Atlanta, they didn't cover black issues until the 1970s. So if you, if you read the white paper, if then you read the black paper, it's like two different worlds. And so that's why when the civil rights movement jumped off in Atlanta and New Orleans and Jackson, Mississippi, white people said, we never knew you all were upset. <laughs> mm. So we just live in two different worlds, but I don't get upset when people say, get over it. Because in their mind, I had an older white pastor tell me the other day, he said, Leonard, I'm just learning all this. He said, I thought when y'all got the right to vote, and got school integration, I thought everything was fine. Yeah. And that many people still have that same belief. So I want to go back to something. You mentioned Malcolm X yeah. and Black Power. Mm -hmm. I know that there are members of our audience that got nervous when you said Malcolm X and Black Power. Why? Those movements, the Black Power movement, yeah. The Black Panthers and such is often a misunderstood movement. Absolutely. Can you explain why that movement is often misunderstood and what the misunderstand misunderstanding is? I, I mean, the one thing about Malcolm, I, 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 when, I, when you look at Malcolm's speeches, he's just asking America to be true to what it to what it said on paper. He's just asking America to include Black folk in this democratic experience, so to speak. I think people get frustrated because all they hear is sound bites and pictures. You know, they just see the Black Panthers running around with guns, and they hear Malcolm X calling white people the devil. But we know that, that our history is much more complex than that, you know. And um, the Black Panthers, they were, you know, they were dealing with the issue of police brutality, you know, in Oakland and parts of California across the country. And Malcolm X was basically just being critical of America to how it is treated African Americans. And what about the Black Panthers? Yeah, that, that, you know, there are some great documentaries out in the Black Panthers. There are some great autobiographies out in the Black Panthers. That has probably been the one uh, organization in America that has been the subject of the most misinterpretation, things of that nature. Now, here's what I have to remind people. Although we get Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, 
You get the Voting Civil Rights Act 1964, the Voting Rights Act 1965. A pivotal day for many of us was April 4th, 1968, when King dies. When King is assassinated, many universities and companies, just by virtue of him being assassinated, created outreach programs to get to bring more African Americans into the system. Mm -hmm. And so some would argue, you know, that it takes the death of somebody to see social progress. So you really don't get the um, the, the civil the the, the, vote, the civil rights act 1964 passed until those three civil rights workers are killed in Mississippi, Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney, two white guys and one black guy. That spurs America to action. Um, the whole Selma piece, getting the, the the Voting Rights Act 1965. What gets America to act? Bloody Sunday when those when those protesters are brutalized on the bridge. And likewise, you get all these access programs when King is assassinated April 4th, 1968. Mm -hmm. What to Ms. Russ, uh -huh. what do you think about resource officers and their role in the school? I have a friend who is an officer in the school district who is constantly having to advocate for the black and brown children in, the, in her middle school because of teachers who want to charge the children with crimes instead of dealing with them administratively. What are your thoughts about what you have heard about this issue? Before you respond, I would like to say that I often say for us to call resource officers what they are, which is law enforcement in our schools. So in Round Rock right now where my kids are, there's a big debate because the superintendent, he wants to hire a police force. They went Round Rock ISD wants to hire their own officers. And of course, he got a lot of push black, pushback from simply black and brown folk and progressive white parents. And one of the responses I heard from a school board member was, okay, Leonard, we're gonna, there's gonna be some law enforcement in the school. Do you want it to be officers that we can train and develop and recruit? Or would you rather that be imposed by an outside entity through one of the, the, the counties or something like that. And it was a very interesting debate. I believe that issue right there with, 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 with black and brown kids when you use criminals, that's an issue with leadership of the school. That, is, that, that, that goes directly to the principal. Um, and so what I would do is get some parents together and have conversations with the principal and partner on a way where there could be more equitable treatment for these particularly brown and black kids. Ms. Ruff says she agrees. My last question, and guys, it is amazing, ladies and gentlemen, how fast an hour mm -hmm. goes, right? What is the future of social justice for black people in America, in your opinion? What does it look like? The one thing um, that we've been dealing with the last 40, 50 years with you know, a lot of black folks moving to the suburbs, that our communities are, are divided. Uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago, the black middle class was right in the neighborhood. Uh, and, and, and I'm guilty of moving to the suburbs. I'm guilty of that. Um, and I think when you have a community like that where everybody's there, you know, pastors there, school teachers there, physicians there, you know, um, hidden figures, those sisters in the, in the community, you know what I mean? Um, I think we were better able to handle some of our own issues. But I think the black middle class, I mean, the, the, the blood that we have on our hands is I think we have, and I'm, I include myself in that. I think that we have in many ways abandoned our uh, less fortunate brothers and sisters to sort of fend for themselves. You know, I think a lot of us are, uh, uh, you know, we, you know, we live in a middle class African-American bubble. You know, we got our Greek organizations, our, nice black middle class church and a lot of us don't come face to face with you know the black poor anymore you know what i mean and um you know and i think that is something that we need to come to grips with thank you is law enforcement this is from miss allen is law enforcement in the schools a response to mass shooting I don't know. I think metal detectors in, in the schools will be a response to mass shootings. Uh, 
I'm not sure. And I'm and uh, so I grew up there was we didn't have I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. We didn't have law enforcement in the school. You had just school security guards. So I never and I don't know why we just can't go back to having security. You know what I mean? I think but when you have law enforcement in the schools with the ability to write tickets and arrest and all that kind of stuff, uh I think that's problematic. Very interesting. With that question, my take has been that mass shootings may be why there's law enforcement in suburban white schools. Right. There was law enforcement being put in urban schools long before right. Columbine. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Police, uh, where am I at here? Police officers were in schools because of the Columbine mass shooting. And so I think that goes to what we were just saying is I think there's a racial aspect to that as we say there's a racial aspect to just about everything. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yes, yes. So as we wrap up, wow, any final words? No, I, I'm, uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity. Um, I think Texas is a great place. Um, and like I said, I mean, be open to having a conversation with people. Because I find in Texas, you know, you can, you know, you can have good conversation and something good can come of it. And I found here people willing to listen, you know, as opposed to back up in the Northeast or Midwest where they say, no, no problems here. I'll, I'll tell one story. I, I was uh, at my daughter's, uh, she was in that competitive cheer stuff, which is super expensive, by the way. <laughs> um, we are in San Antonio, and one of the other parents found that I worked at UT. And this is a dad from Westlake. And um, I think I told you this story before, you know, he felt that, uh, you know, you know, we were letting in too many <laughs> unqualified black and Latino students. And I just appreciated him being honest with what he felt. And then we proceeded to have a very, I think, fruitful conversation for about 30 minutes. And he said, Leonard, OK, I understand the top 10 percent rule now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We make change through conversation, Absolutely. through changing laws, policies, That's but it right. has to start with an honest That's conversation. Right. That's right. Wow. Thank you. I want to come sit in oh, on your class. Well, Let's start uh, there. Yeah, so if you all ever in Austin in the fall semester, Tuesday and Thursday, uh, my Black Power class, I think it's the best class in all of higher education. We'll be about 550 students in there. It's a lot of fun. You know, there's no political correctness. You know, my white conservative students, they like it because they can they can uh, voice their uh, views and opinions. And one of the best complaints I got came from one of my white conservative students. He said, Dr. Moore, I disagree with everything you say, but whatever class you teach at UT, I'll sign up for it. And for me, that that I think that's what education is about. That is huge. We thank you for giving us your time today. This is Tanya Rollins, the CPS Disproportionality Manager. We thank all of you for joining our webinar today and hope that you will tune in for our next webinar in April, on April 17th, with Noelle Pinnock from the Houston Bureau of Youth and Adolescent Health. It will prove to be an interesting conversation. Once again, thank you, Dr. Moore. Today has been a history lesson that I am very thankful to have gotten. With that, we wish everyone a great day and be safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wasn't talking too loud. <laughs>